Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm a PhD student at Cornell. And today I'll be talking about the space complexity of sampling. This is joint work with Ishan Chattopadhyay and David Zuckerman. So complexity theory asks the question, how many computational resources are required to complete a certain task? Traditionally, this task has been computing a Boolean function, f. And traditionally, some computational resources that have been of particular interest are time and space. In order to formalize the use of these resources, what we do is we fix a computational model, and that model usually has some size parameter, which corresponds nicely to one of these computational resources. So now, given a so-called computer from our computational model, we say that it computes the function f if, for every possible input x, the output of c on x is the same thing as f of x. So given this formalization, the question becomes now, what is the smallest C from our computational class that computes F? And we can call this the complexity of computing or computational complexity. But beyond this task of computing a function, another task that shows up a lot in computer science is sampling from a distribution. So it's natural then to wonder how powerful are our favorite computational models for the alternative task of sampling? Inspired by the works of Mbaina, Shulman, Tashma, Vazirani, and Bergerson, and Goldreg, Goldwasser, and Nussbaum, Viola launched a systematic study into this question in 2012. To formalize this question, what we do is we pick one of our computational models from before and a so-called computer from this class. But now, instead of giving it a fixed input x, what we give it is a uniformly random input, big X. And we say that C samples the distribution Q if the output distribution C on a uniformly random input is exactly the same as Q. So the question here becomes, what is the smallest C from our computational class that samples the distribution Q? And we can call this the complexity of sampling or the complexity of distribution. Beyond these two specific questions, the, co the complexity of computing and the complexity of sampling are generally interested in just understanding the power of various computational models for the task of computing and the task of sampling. In this work, we'll focus on understanding the complexity of sampling. So recently, there have been a lot of really exciting works that further our understanding of the complexity of sampling. However, while these make really significant progress, results are still only known for a few computational models like AC0 circuits and communication protocols. And in particular, not much is really known about the complexity of sampling with limited memory. So in this work, we aim to fill this gap and study the space complexity of sampling. And before we do so, I need to answer two questions for you. The first one is, what should our limited memory model be? And the second one is, what are some interesting questions to ask about sampling with this model? So let's understand now what our model will be. So our model for sampling with limited memory will just be the standard model of read once branching programs or ROBP. A read once branching program is just a layered Directed, a, directed acyclic graph. The number of layers, let's say it's M, we'll call this the input length. And then each layer will have exactly W nodes, which we will call the width of the branching program. And there will also be a designated start vertex V star. Each internal node will have exactly two edges going into the subsequent layer, which it labels with a zero and one. But instead of keeping these labels around, let's just color code the edges so that the diagram won't get too messy. And finally, all of the nodes in the terminal layer of the ROBP will, label, will be labeled with a bit, zero, or one. Now, this ROBP computes a function in the natural way. So given an input x, what it does is it reads it bit by bit and uses these as instructions for which edge to follow at each junction. And then finally, when it reaches a node in the terminal layer of the ROBP, it just outputs the label of that node. So while such an ROBP can of course generate a distribution by being said a uniformly random bit string, this distribution will only be over one bit because the ROBP is computing a function um, that just outputs one bit. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to somehow augment this model so that we can sample distributions over n bits. We need a so-called multi-output ROBP. So in order to do this, the idea is we're just going to remove the output labels from the final nodes. And then we're going to add an output label to each edge in the ROBP. 
And then if we do this, our ROBP will compute, will compute a function that can output multiple bits, again, in the natural way. So given an input X, once again, it reads it bit by bit and uses these as instructions on which, uh, at, for which edge it should take at each junction. But now when it traverses an edge, it examines what is the output label on that edge, and it appends that to the output of the program. Now it does this reading the input bit by bit until eventually it reaches the end of the branching program and it has outputted all the bits that it has seen. <clears throat> so this is great. We now have an ROBP that can output multiple bits, but one problem is that the output length of this ROBP might not actually be consistent over all inputs. And this is because different paths in the ROBP may actually have different output lengths. So what we'd like to do is add just one small restriction so that the output length is consistent over all inputs. To do this, what we're going to do is for any two consecutive layers, we're going to require that all of the edges between them have, the, have output labels with the same length, say NI. For example, maybe all of the edges going between these two layers have output labels with length two. And then we say that the output length of this ROBP is just the sum of all the NIs. <clears throat> and now notice that if we feed in a uniformly random string to our ROBP, we generate a distribution over N bits, which is what we wanted. So that completes the specification of our ROBP. And I should note uh, that this specification is very similar to multi-output or multi-bit, multi-output ROBPs uh, that were studied in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> now I should, I should also note that our main parameter of interest here will be the width W of the branching program. We won't be so concerned with the input length M, meaning how many random bits it will be allowed to use. <clears throat> so that's our limited memory model for sampling, ROBPs. And now we'd like to know what are some interesting questions to ask about sampling with ROBPs. To understand what the interesting questions are, uh, we're going to visit this paradigm that appears in a lot of papers on the complexity of sampling, which is that sampling in many cases is actually easier than computing. What I mean by this is that there are functions such that actually computing the function on every single possible input is very hard, but just sampling the output distribution of this function, which is given a uniform input, is very easy. So as an explicit, as an example, consider setting F to the inverse of a one-way permutation. Of course, it'll be hard to compute F, but the output distribution of F is just a uniform random variable, which is very easy to sample. There are also explicit examples for AC0 circuits, and in our work, we show an explicit example for ROBP. So because of this, it turns out that sampling lower bound, bounds are actually strictly harder to prove than classical lower bounds. Hence, in order to pursue sampling lower bounds, we'll need new techniques, and it might be the case that there are surprising applications and we will see that that is actually true. So given this, our goal is to obtain sampling lower bounds against ROBP. We have two main results in this direction. Our first result are very strong sampling lower bounds against a meaningful explicit distribution. And our second main result is a so-called direct product here for sampling with ROBP. So now I'll provide a little bit of background and formally state each result. So let's start with our strong lower bounds. So if we'd like to obtain sampling lower bounds, the first question uh, you should ask is, can we just find the distribution that cannot be sampled uh, by our computational model? So one of the first computational models this question was examined in uh, were AC0 circuits. And so here the question is, can we find a distribution Q that cannot be sampled by any AC0 circuit? Well, it turns out this is actually trivial. Uh, we can just take a distribution which assigns an irrational probability uh, to some element in its support. And because the AC0 circuit is receiving as input a uniformly random bit string of length M, it cannot possibly sample an irrational probability. So the more interesting question raised by Viola in 2012 was, can we find a distribution that cannot even approximately be sampled by AC0? And by approximately, we mean that we want to find the distribution such that the output distribution of any AC0 circuit is one minus epsilon far from Q in statistical distance. So this question was answered by Lovett and Viola in 2012, where they exhibited 
a meaningful explicit distribution that is uh, such that any, the output distribution of any AC0 circuit is polynomially far from Q. And then late, a later paper by Beck and Pagliazzo and Lovett improved this sampling lower bound uh, to be exponentially to be exponentially far. So the output distribution of any AC0 circuit, they show that it's exponentially far from Q. And it turns out this was a very natural distribution. It was the uniform distribution over any good code. So as a reminder, a code or an NKD code is just a subset of bit strings of length N. It has size two to the K, and it gives the guarantee that for any two distinct uh, strings in this subset, the Hamming distance between them is at least D. And we refer to D as the distance and K as the dimension of the code. Now, a good code is just an NKD code, which has constant relative dimension and constant relative distance. So it should be remarked that while Lovett and Viola and Beck and Pagliazzo and Lovett show that AC0 circuits cannot sample good codes, it's actually very easy to show that good codes can be sampled using communication protocols. And a natural question is then, are good codes hard to sample with ROBPs? So our first main result answers this question in the positive, and we show the following. For any good code, or rather a distribution uniform over a good code, and any ROBP which has width, say, 2 to the 0.01n, the output distribution of that ROBP will be exponentially far from a good code. So given a connection made by Viola in 2012, our result also has applications to data structure lower bounds for storing code words. So that's our first main result. Now our second main result is a direct product theorem for sampling with RLBPs. So given that we wanna pursue sampling lower bounds, a natural question is, if we have a distribution that's a little bit hard to sample for a computational class, can we somehow use it to build another distribution that is very hard to sample for that class? And even more so, we're wondering, can we build from Q a distribution Q star that is just slightly more complex? but that is much harder to sample. And if we can find such a Q star, then we'll be able to strengthen known separations between complexity classes. <clears throat> In order to answer this question, or this question is directly answered by direct product theorems. So in the context of computing, a direct product theorem is roughly defined as follows. So it says the following. So suppose that you have a function F that is hard to compute for the class C, and it says that you can build a function f cross t that is very hard to compute for the class t as follows. So f cross t will take its input, it'll chop it up into t parts, and then it'll just apply the hard function f to each part. And that's what a direct product theorem is. And a very well-known direct product theorem is Yao's x y dynamic. In the context of sampling, a direct product theorem might be defined as follows. So suppose that you have a distribution that is hard to sample for a class C. Then we'd like to build a distribution Q cross T that is very hard to sample for C. And a good candidate distribution is just taking T independent copies of Q and concatenating them together. <clears throat> However, while this is a relatively natural question, there are actually no known direct product theorems for the task of sampling. And so what we'd like to know then is, can we establish a direct product theorem for sampling, and in particular for ROVPs? So our second main result establishes such a theorem. We show the following. If it holds that for any width W ROVP, its output distribution is delta far from the distribution Q, then it holds that for any width W ROVP, its output distribution is exponentially far from the distribution Q cross T. So that's our second main result. So just to summarize everything, <clears throat> our main result is a sampling lower bound against good codes and a direct product theorem. So previously, sampling lower bounds against good codes were known for AC0 circuits. And it, it is known and not too hard to show that communication protocols can actually very easily sample good codes. Our first main result shows that ROBPs have a very, very hard time sampling good codes. And using a connection by Viola, uh, we obtained data structure lower bounds for storing code words. Now, in terms of a direct product theorem, 
nothing was actually known for any computational model for the task of sampling. And our second main result establishes uh, this direct product theorem for RLBPs. And what's cool is that along the way, one of our key ingredients actually gives a simple new proof of a result by Boos and Watson for sampling disjoint sets using communication protocols. So those are our two main results. In the remainder of this talk, I'll provide proof sketches of our two main results. We'll start with our sampling lower bounds against good codes. The proof of our sampling lower bounds relies on three key ingredients. The first key ingredient roughly says that a convex combination of distributions, each far from some target distribution Q, is itself far from the target distribution Q. The second key ingredient says that distributions sampled by low width ROBPs are a convex combination of so-called low width product distributions. And the third key ingredient, which is the main ingredient in this proof, says that low width product distributions are far from good codes. Now, given these three key ingredients, it's easy to obtain our sampling lower bounds for ROBPs against good codes. In particular, by, by combining ingredient two and ingredient three, we get that distributions sampled by low width ROBPs are a convex combination of distributions that are far from good codes. And then by applying ingredient one, we get that distributions sampled by low with ROBPs are themselves far from good codes. So all that remains is to dive into these three ingredients. We'll start with ingredient one, which says that a convex combination of far distributions is far. So recall that a distribution X is a convex combination of distributions X1 through XT, if it can be written in the following form, where X samples from XI with probability PI. Now, a standard fact about convex combination that's not too difficult to prove is that a convex combination of close distributions is close, meaning that if we can write X as a convex combination of distributions XI, and each XI is delta close to X, then it follows that X itself is delta close to X. And moreover, the proof is not too hard to show. It follows from a relatively straightforward application of the triangle inequality. But recall that this isn't what we wanted to show for our ingredient. We wanted to kind of show the opposite. We wanted to show that a convex combination of far distributions is far, meaning that if we can write X as a convex combination of distributions XI, and each XI is delta far from the distribution Q, does it follow that X itself is delta far from the distribution Q? Well, it's not hard to show that this is blatantly wrong and for the following reason. Suppose that we let I range over the support of our random variable Q. And then for each I, we define a random variable XI, which is constantly equal to I. And then finally, we define a probability PI, which is just the probability that Q equals I. So if we consider the convex combination defined over these things, we get that X exactly samples Q. On the other hand, as long as Q is not a constant random variable, each XI will have statistical distance strictly greater than zero from Q, meaning that this statement can't possibly be true. So you might be wondering what's the deal because this is our first key ingredient. Well, this is where the asterisk comes into play. Hidden behind the asterisk is the statement provided there are not too many participants in the convex combination. So more formally now, our ingredient one says the following. It says, suppose we have a distribution X that can be written as a convex combination of distributions XI. And suppose that each XI is one minus delta far from the distribution Q. And furthermore, suppose there, that there are at most T participants in the convex combination. Then it follows that the original distribution X is one minus T times delta far from Q. Now, this is just a slight generalization of a lemma proven by Viola, where it was required that each PI was the same. So that completes our discussion of ingredient one. Now we move on to discuss ingredient two, which says that distribution sampled by low width ROBPs are a convex combination of so-called low width product distributions. Now, this, was re this result was proven in al alternative language by Koenig and Moore and Camp, Rao, Vedan, and Zuckman. So in order to prove this result, let's recall that a random variable X samples a product distribution 
if it can be written as a concatenation of r independent chunks, each an independent random variable over l bits. And of course, we require that r times l equals n. Now, we say that the product distribution has low width if the number of bits in each chunk is not too much, that is, if l is small. So now that we know what a low width product distribution is, let's revisit the ingredient that we want to prove. So let's recall what a low width ROBP looks like, and let's recall how it samples the distribution. Well, what it does is it takes in a uniformly random bit string Y, and it follows the path whose colors match the input bits in Y. And then it simply outputs the output bits it sees on the edges along the way. Now, if you think a little bit, there's actually a different way to describe this process that doesn't have to do with input at all. So what we can do is we can disregard any input and we can instead just, and any colors on the edges as well. And we can instead just start at the designated start vertex, take a uniformly random walk along the branching program and output the output bits it sees along the way. And notice that this is actually going to sample an equivalent distribution, an exact, exactly the same distribution. And even more so, this alternative interpretation will make it much easier to prove our second ingredient. So given this alternative interpretation, let's now consider some layer, perhaps the middle layer, and consider conditioning on hitting some fixed node V in that middle layer. Well, if you think about it a little, it turns that given this conditioning, the distribution X actually gets split up into two independent parts, X1 and X2. And furthermore, if you take a random walk over this branching program, it's guaranteed that it will hit exactly one vertex in this layer, always. And so by considering all possible conditionings over these vertices, we see that X is a convex combination of distributions of the same form. Moreover, since there are W vertices in this layer, the convex combination will have W distributions in it. <clears throat> And furthermore, we can assume without loss of generality that each independent chunk within X is over N over two bits. Because if this is not the case, we can easily perform some sort of pre-processing operations on our ROBP before we begin this analysis. So next, let's consider a slightly more general idea, which is to condition on hitting some sequence of nodes across R layers. Now, it's relatively straightforward to extend the previous argument to say that if you consider all possible conditionings of this form, we see that X is actually a convex combination of distributions, each consisting of R independent chunks. And the number of elements or participants in this convex combination is exactly W to the R, because that is the number of possibilities of fixings of these vertices across all these R layers. And furthermore, for the same reasons as before, we can assume without loss of generality that each chunk in there has the same number of bits in it, namely L, which is N over R. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to pick an R so that two things are true. We'd like L to be small because we wanna show that it's a convex combination of low width product distribution. And second, we'd like w, R to be, w to the R to be small because eventually we're gonna invoke our first ingredients. And recall that our first ingredient in this proof relies on bounding the number of participants in the convex combination. And this is how many participants we have in this convex combination. But you might be a little wary because we know that R times L equals N. So one of these things can't be too small. But it turns out if we just ensure that the width W of the branching program is not too big, we can make sure that both of these quantities at least don't get too ridiculously huge. So that concludes our discussion of our second key ingredient. And now we move to talk about our third and final and main key ingredient, that low width product distributions are far from good codes. So here we have one main key idea, which is a sort of anti-concentration result of product distribution in Hamming balls. So let me explain what I mean by that. So recall that a Hamming ball centered at V with the radius R is just a collection of all strings that have Hamming distance at most R from V. Now consider a product distribution X, which satisfies some sort of basic non-triviality conditions. What our key idea says that says is that if you look at the probability mass that X assigns to a ball, most of it is actually not going to be on the center of the ball. And this is where our sort of anti-concentration result comes from. 
So given this key idea, how can we use it to prove ingredient three? Well, the idea is to consider our NKD code. And now by the distance property of the code, what we can do is we can draw disjoint balls to be around each code word of radius just slightly less than D over two. And now if we consider product distribution X by our anti-concentration results, our key idea, we can say that actually almost all the probability mass that X assigns to the space is missing the code Q, it's missing these center points. And so we can then conclude that X must be relatively far from the uniform distribution over the code Q. So now that we know what our key idea is and how it can be used to prove ingredient three, we're gonna give a formal statement of this key idea and a proof sketch of it. So the formal statement is as follows. So suppose you have a product distribution, which consists of R chunks, each over L bits. And of course, again, we always have R times L equals N. Now it says that for any ball with the radius big L, which is just some valid integer multiple of little L, the following inequality holds. It says the probability that X hits the center of the ball divided by the probability that X hits the ball itself is upper bounded by this quantity. So in particular, the smaller this expression is on the left, the stronger the anti-concentration result is because it's saying there's a lot of weight in the ball that is not landing on the center, the smaller that this gets. So given this, if we'd like to apply it in order to obtain ingredient three, we actually need to have, we need to be examining it for a ball with radius and big L that is strictly less than D over two. And that's because recall in our proof of ingredient three, we're drawing balls around the code words of radius less than D over two to make sure they don't intersect. So we therefore also need little L to be at most D over two, but this is taken care of by the assumption that we're in a low width product distribution. So next we have some desires. So our first desire is that we want actually big L to be large, even though we have this kind of strict upper bound. Well, it turns, and the reason we want this to be large is because recall that we want this expression to be small that corresponds to a stronger anti-concentration result. And since this is a probability on the right here between zero and one, the bigger L is, the smaller this quantity will become. Well, it turns out that this uh, strict kind of upper bound on big L is not that big of a deal because we're dealing with good codes, namely codes that have distance that's linear in N, which means that we can actually make this power a constant that's bounded away from zero. So our second desire is we want the probability that X hits the center of the ball to be as small as possible, because again, that's going to minimize this expression on the left here. Well, it turns out that this should be true for most of the code words. And that's just because the code has good dimension. Namely, it has a lot of code words. So now, now that we know uh, what our anti-concentration result is and how it can be used, we're going to prove it. So the proof goes as follows. So we're going to use the letter V to represent the center of our ball. And we'll color code it appropriately. So uh, let's start with the trivial lower bound on the probability that X hits the ball. So of course the probability that X hits the ball is at least the probability that X hits the center of the ball, right? And since X is a product distribution, that probability is exactly equal to this. But we can do something smarter here, right? So what we can do is we can say the following. For any subset of coordinates of size C, if we consider an X that matches the center of the ball V on all chunks I falling outside of this set S, it must follow that X is in the ball. And the reason for this is the only places where X does not exactly match V are the chunks uh, labeled by an index I that is not an S. Well, there are C such indices and each chunk contains L bits. So X can differ from the center of the ball by at most C times L locations, which is at most the radius of the ball. So therefore X is in the ball. Now, given this observation, we can lower bound the probability that X is in the ball by something more clever than this original probability. Namely, we can remove from the product all the probabilities equal to of the form XI equals VI, where I is in the set 
And now a simple inequality or simple equality is that this is exactly the same thing as the probability that X hits the center of the ball divided by the probability that each coordinate I in X, each coordinate I in S labels a chunk in X that I exactly matches the corresponding chunk at the center of the ball. So now in order to conclude this and provide a strong lower bound on this expression, we wanna provide an upper bound on this expression. And in order to do this, all you have to do is let S be the set that minimizes this quantity on the left here. And through a quick calculation, you can show that this is exactly upper bounded by the quantity we want. And then by rearranging terms, we get our result. So that completes the proof of our key idea. And we've already seen how it can be used to obtain ingredient three. So that concludes our discussion of ingredient three. And now since ingredient three was the last ingredient that went into our main result, one, we finished our proof of our sampling lower bounds for ROBPs against good codes. Next, we give a proof of our direct product theorem. Recall that it says the following. Suppose that we have some distribution Q such that for any width W ROBP, the output distribution of that ROBP is delta far from Q. Then it follows that for any width W ROBP, the output distribution of it is exponentially far from the distribution Q cross T. And recall that we define Q cross T to just be T independent copies of Q concatenated together. Now, the proof of our direct product theorem goes via two key ingredients. The first key ingredient is kind of a more general direct product theorem that works for any distribution family satisfying a special so-called slice property, which we'll define in a moment. Then the second key ingredient is a proof that the family of distribution sampled by width WROBPs has the slice property. And so by combining these two ingredients, we immediately obtain our direct product theorem for sampling with ROBPs. So all that remains is to dive into these two ingredients and we'll start by looking at ingredient one, which is our more general direct product theorem. So formally, it states the following. Suppose we have some distribution Q and some family curly X, which satisfies the slice property. Then if it holds that every distribution in this family is delta far from Q, it follows that every distribution in this family is exponentially far from the distribution Q cross T. So that's the theorem. And now I can finally tell you what the slice property is. So we say that the family curly X has a slice property. If the existence of a distribution X in this family implies the existence of this related distribution in this family. And let me tell you how this related distribution is constructed and defined. So first consider the distribution X or rather the random variable X. Then we define X sub I to J to be the slice of X going from coordinates I to J, meaning we're gonna cut off all bits coming before coordinate I and all bits coming after coordinate J. Then finally, we define X sub I to J to the Z as this slice conditioned on fixing the bits coming before I to the value Z. And so that's the slice property. And note that it has to hold for all possible I, J, and Z. And if you want a formal definition, of this related random variable, I can uh, flash one up on the screen here. So in order to prove this theorem, <clears throat> we, we prove a simple new lemma on amplifying statistical distance. So it looks something like the following. So suppose that you have any distribution Q and any distribution Y, which consists of T independent distributions concatenated together. Furthermore, Suppose that each yi is delta far from q. Then it follows that the original distribution y consisting of all the yi's concatenated together is exponentially far from the distribution q cross t. Now I sort of lied. So this is a very uh, well-known lemma and it has a fun proof, but it doesn't actually work for what we need in order to prove our theorem. So we need to prove a similar lemma that kind of works for a sequence of somewhat dependent random variables. So we'd like to get rid of this condition here. So our new key lemma shows how to do this. And we do this just by strengthening the hypothesis of this lemma just by a little bit. So instead of requiring that each yi is delta far from Q, 
we have a slightly stronger requirement that each yi to the z is delta far from q. And here yi to the z means yi conditioned on the bits before it being fixed to z. So the proof of this result is a little difficult if you try to do it using statistical distance, but it turns out to admit a pretty clean uh, short proof if you instead consider more amenable notions of distance, such as the Bhattacharya coefficient. Then, given this simple new lemma, the proof for our theorem is immediate, and it goes as follows. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to take some arbitrary x prime in our family curly x, which has the slice property, and lower bound the statistical distance between x prime and q cross t. In order to do this, the first observation is that the distribution x prime, or rather the random variable x prime, can be parsed in this form as t consecutive random variables, each n bits long. Now, what we'd like to do is somehow argue that this hypothesis of the lemma must hold. Well, notice that yi to the z is actually the same thing as taking a slice of x prime and preconditioning it, conditioning the bits that come before the slice to be fixed to something. But notice that such a distribution must be in the family curly x because it has the slice problem. And thus, by the hypothesis of this theorem, we must have this basic lower bound on statistical distance. And then we can use this to obtain the hypothesis of our key lemma. And thus we obtain the conclusion of our key lemma, which is the exact same thing as the conclusion of our theorem. And that proves the theorem. And that completes our discussion of ingredient one, which is our general direct product theorem for distribution families with the slice property. So now we move to talk about our key ingredient two, which shows that the family of distribution sampled by with the WROBPs has the slice property. So recall that the slice property says that if a distribution X is in the family, it's required that this related distribution is also in this family. So it has this certain closure property. And in the context of ROBPs, what we'd like to show is that if there's a distribution X sampleable by with W ROBPs, then the distribution X from I to J conditioned on fixing the bits before I to Z should also be sampleable by with W ROBPs. So the key tool that we'll use to show this is the construction of a with two ROBP that can sample an arbitrary distribution over one bit or rather it can come arbitrarily close to sampling such a distribution. In order to construct this with W ROBP, the key idea is to encode the so-called success probability of this target distribution as a bit string, namely as its Boolean representation uh, up to you know, some certain precision, desired precision. Then we're going to use this bit string as instructions to construct our ROBP. In particular, each bit in the string will tell us how we should draw the edges between a certain pair of layers. And that's the key idea, and it ends up working out for constructing such a width uh, to ROBP. So then we're going to use this key tool as a module to construct a more general width W ROBP that can sample an arbitrary distribution over this larger alphabet W. And given our width to ROBP, it's actually not too difficult to do just by concatenating these with two modules in kind of an overlapping sequence structure. So now that we have a with W ROBP that can sample an arbitrary distribution D, or rather for any arbitrary distribution D, we have a with W ROBP that can sample it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show the slice property. So suppose that we have an arbitrary distribution X and it's sampleable by with W ROBPs. For example, maybe this is the ROBP that samples it. We want to somehow perform surgery on it to create a with W ROBP that samples its related distribution. So we're gonna do so as follows. So first of all, we can assume without loss of generality um, that each edge in this ROBP, the output bit on it, uh, the output label on it is just one bit. And if this is not the case, it's easy to do some sort of pre-processing pre-processing uh, to make sure that this happens. So given such an ROBP, we're going to focus on layers I and J, and we're going to completely remove the part of the ROBP that comes before I, and the part of the ROBP that comes after J. And after this, 
uh, note that since we want to not just sample the slice from I to J, we want to sample the slice from I to J conditioned on this fixing. What we need is we need to somehow construct a width W module that simulates what happens when we fix these first few output bits to be Z. So given our width W ROBP that can sample any distribution D, we can construct a width W module that does exactly that. So we're going to use this module to replace the original part of the ROBP and stitch it onto the layer I. And it is then not too difficult to show that this new ROBP, this sort of Frankenstein ROBP, samples the exact distribution we were targeting, thereby showing that the family of distribution sample, sampleable but with the WROBP has the slice property. So that completes our overview of ingredient two. And since we know that ingredient one and ingredient two immediately prove our direct product theorem, we're done with our proof sketch for our direct product theorem. So that completes our proof sketches of our two main results. To conclude, we proved sampling lower bounds against good codes for ROBPs, and we proved the direct product theorem for the task of sampling with ROBPs. Previously, sampling lower bounds against good codes were only known for AC0 circuits. And in fact, it's easy to show that communication protocols have no trouble sampling good codes. In this work, we show that ROBPs are more like AC0 circuits for the task, in that they have a very hard time sampling good codes. In particular, we show that for any good code and for any ROBP of width, say, 2 to the 0.01n, it holds that the output distribution of that ROBP is exponentially far from the good code. And in fact, the sampling lower bounds that we get are even a little bit stronger than the best known for AC0 circuits. Now, using a known connection from Viola, we automatically also get data structure lower bounds for the task of storing code width. In the context of our direct product theorem, previously, no direct product theorems were known for the task of sampling in any computational model. In this work, we give the first result of such a type, and we prove a direct product theorem for the task of sampling with ROBPs. In particular, we show that for any distribution Q, if we can show that any with W ROBP outputs a distribution that is delta far from Q, then we can conclude that any with W ROBP outputs a distribution that is exponentially far from the distribution Q cross T. And one nice thing about this proof is that along the way, we use a simple new key ingredient that also allows us to give a simple new proof of a known result by Goose and Watson on sampling disjoint sets using communication protocols. Now, since this is a very new area, the complexity of sampling, a lot of interesting open problems remain. For example, it would be cool to see if we could prove a direct product theorem for other computational models, such as AC0 circuits. Given our technique for proving the direct product theorem for sampling with ROBPs, to prove a direct product theorem for sampling with AC0 circuits, it would suffice to show that AC0 circuits have the slice property. Next, it would be interesting to generalize our ROBP sampling lower bounds to read K branching programs. A lot of our lower bounds depend on being able to cut up the ROBP into independent parts. And this is much more difficult to do when you allow it to read an input bit more than once. Finally, it would be interesting to see if we could prove separations between sampling with AC0 circuits and with ROBPs. In particular, it is actually easy to show a distribution that can be sampled with AC0 circuits, but is very hard to sample with ROBPs. On the other hand, it could be more interesting to try to understand if there's a distribution that can be sampled with ROBPs that cannot be sampled with AC0 circuits. In order to do this, one thing that would be one thing that would suffice would be to construct a randomness extractor for distributions generated by AC0 circuits, such that the randomness extractor can be computed by a read once branching program. However, it turns out that all known extractors right now that work for distributions generated by AC0 circuits also work for distributions generated by ROBPs. So right now, our current extractors cannot work and new ideas are needed. So that concludes my talk. Thanks for stopping by and I hope you enjoyed it.